The Sarawak Dolphin Project strives toward the necessary balance of future conservation and sustainable development efforts which require partnership between industry, government and research institutions to achieve the most effective results. In our first year we had one postgraduate student, Cindy, um, and she's been with the project from the very beginning, from May 2008. And she's almost completing her MSc thesis on the ecology of Irrawaddy dolphins in the Kuching area. So now we're very lucky to have Jenny and Anna with us as well. We've learned quite a bit about the dolphins' distribution, the four different species we've seen. And we're trying to put those pieces together to figure out now how we can work with communities and with the government to try and protect the habitats that are most important for them. The university's Institute of Biodiversity and Environmental Conservation, IBEC, was founded with the aim of working to understand and preserve the state's wildlife and important habitats, both terrestrial and marine. Another important part of our work takes place here in the Molecular Laboratory at UNIMAS. From time to time, we receive telephone calls from fishermen or other interested members of the public who have found a dead dolphin tangled in their net or stranded on the beach. We try to reach these animals as quickly as possible so that we can collect samples from them and learn more about their biology and their ecology and therefore their conservation. We always do this in cooperation with the Sarawak Forestry Corporation. And when we reach the animal, we collect uh, skin and tissue samples for DNA analysis, stomach content samples to learn what the dolphin has been eating about its diet and ecology, and also teeth samples, which we can use to age the dolphins by counting growth layer groups. Efforts are underway to work with other laboratories that have conducted genetic analysis on similar species to map out a scientifically responsible approach to genetic analysis. Priority has been given to analysis of humpback dolphin samples as the taxonomy of the species throughout its range is undergoing analysis and review. Stomach contents have also been collected and will become the focus of future studies looking at cetaceans distribution, prey preferences and fisheries interactions. So in the stomach contents you can see the prawn is very obviously a prawn like the prawns that we all eat. Um, but what we're most interested in is the hard prey remains. So from a squid or a cuttlefish, a uh, sopong, you get uh, hard remains like this beak, which is the, the mouth of the squid or the cuttlefish. And then identifying the species of fish that the dolphin has eaten is very difficult from just a skeleton from the vertebrae like this, you would not be able to identify the species of fish. But um, fish have tiny, tiny ear bones called otoliths, which are so small it's going to be very difficult for us to sift them out of here once we get down to our proper analysis. But every fish has a uniquely shaped ear bone. We'll be able to identify the species of fish that the penless porpoise has been eating from examining those under a microscope. The Kuching Wetlands National Park was gazetted in 1992 and covers an area of 66.1 square kilometers on the estuary Rhine reaches of the Cebu Laut and Salak rivers. The park is composed of coastal, marine and freshwater ecosystems. The park is home for proboscis monkey, long-tailed macaque, silver-leaf langur, monitor lizard, estuary rhine crocodile, white-bellied eagle, mudskipper, horseshoe crab, otter, hornbill, kingfisher, and shorebird, and Irrawaddy dolphins. These dolphins normally travel in groups of two to six individuals, but groups of up to 20 individuals are sometimes sighted around the Santubong and Buntal coastal areas. Initial surveys in Kuching showed that the Irradi dolphins were the mostly encountered species. That is why I chose to focus on this species for my master's project. Besides that, from the conservation perspective, we also know that the Irradi dolphins are threatened throughout Southeast Asia, 
that is why we felt that it was important to put a focus on this species for our project. Irrawaddy humpback and bottlenose dolphins can be distinguished by nicks and scars on their dorsal fins. In 2010, we had our first sighting of Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin in the area. Uh, this is why we have widened our focus to include humpback dolphins, bottlenose dolphins and also finless porpoise. And this is also why we have started photo identification of humpback dolphins. Together with um, water parameter sampling, I would be able to study and compare the habitat use of all four species in the area. Although sometimes called the Irrawaddy River Dolphin, it is not a true river dolphin, but an oceanic dolphin that lives in brackish water near coasts, river mouths, and in estuaries. But how do we identify them? Humpback dolphins have rostrum and hump on their dorsal fin. The youngs are grey in colour and they turn pink as they grow older. Irrawaddy dolphins don't have a rostrum and they are light grey in colour. But for certain species of whales, like the humpback whale, photo identification is done on their tail fluke because each tail has unique marking and when they dive, they will show their tail fluke. Unlike whales, small cetaceans seldom do that. This is like the coastal species, the Irrawaddy, that dolphin we find here in Sarawak. They are very shy, very gentle looking, um, very subdued animals apparently, but maybe we don't know much about them. They're probably on certain behaviors that also show some, some other types, but generally they are more shy compared to the spinner dolphins. So each species has its own uh, character. Some you can see and you can notice right away. The others you will have to spend a lot of time looking for them.